I'm calling a pictorial overview. And I'll see where I turn my mic off to if anyone wants to come step forward and we'll get an echoing if I can't figure out how to turn my mic down. But um, let me see, I see a window over here. Nope. Um, so anyway, I started in about 2007, first playing with virtual reality. And you'll see some of what my playing was, but let me bring this next slide up to show you that one way you can think about virtual reality, and there are many ways, levels you can come in on, is thinking about just an instructional metaphor to sound kind of uh, educational-like, where you can design anything from a field trip to discussions to role-playing. And if you really are interested, I don't know if you can see this, but you can actually get into building and creating. Now that gets a little bit advanced, and I'm pleased to be able to do that right now with my students, but that's not the only way you need to use it. And so what I wanted to emphasize, and I think I can do this somewhat interactively, that community evolves from the type of experiences that you bring the students to. You know, just as when they come and sit down in front of you in a face-to-face -face classroom, you can have students that just don't get involved. A lot will depend on how you as an instructor design the environment. So community really happens naturally because, strange as it might sound, a virtual embodiment becomes very much the person themselves, especially if you wind it in over time. So what I'm saying to you is you can have a space to go to now, and I'll show you some examples. What you do in it is what will make it into a community. So I'm going to open this one. I often am bringing virtual reality to people who really are a little skeptical. You know, why isn't it just playing? And it can be playing. Um, why is it good teaching? So across the top of here, I just simply put many, many of the educational factors that can be brought in through a virtual environment. And I'm in education, so these are just terms we use. Um, Tony, mode, yeah. Did you see the, uh, the webcam pictures on the right-hand side of your screen? Uh, yes. You can drag that down just so people can see your full screen. Yeah, you oh. can also minimize it as well. There's a little, uh, if you click the little icon at the top, you see the webcam screens? Okay, the icon at the, oh, way up at the top? Nope, do you see the webcam screens on your screen? Yeah, with the faces? I yep. see Rebecca. Yep, and then you can actually minimize that. There's little icons on the top where you can click and, and minimize them just so you don't, so it doesn't take up your screen and block out any text you might want us to see. Okay. You know what I can't find, Andrew? How do I mute myself? Wait a minute. Uh, bottom left-hand corner. Bottom left. Okay, I think I'm hiding that one. Bottom left-hand corner of the uh, control panel, you'll see a little microphone icon. Okay. All right. Okay, I don't seem to find that, and I'm afraid, am I creating an annoying echo? No, not at all. Okay. Um, Andrew, maybe I could ask you to let me know if I'm missing, uh, if somebody wants sure. to interject and I might miss it. Sure, yeah, I can definitely help you out. Okay, I, I'm a little worried about making this full screen, uh, or total desktop, uh, excuse me, just sharing the application. So I, if this works, I'll just leave it open. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Um, just across the top, I'm bringing in a number of the educational theories that could be embedded in a virtual environment, and it's truly everything. You, it, again, it depends on what you're doing, how you run it. You could run it from being anything from a lecture to a shared experience. So just keep that in mind. Now, I will digress for about six slides to give you a little bit of the history of virtual reality so that you'll understand where it comes from. And what I want to suggest that if this becomes of interest to you, you can start in on different levels. 
Second Life, from the perspective of current uses, is the big player in virtual reality. And what they did a number of years ago was made their source code open. So now other vendors can come in. As a result, you can work from anything such as renting Second Life Islands, and SUNY owns a number of Second Life Islands that you can visit and use. So you can bring your students to Second Life Islands that SUNY owns. There's also a whole network of islands, and I'll show you some pictures from them, that you can go and visit. What made me very excited, though, is to the right here, I can now create my own island. And since part of my teaching is to teach people how to create islands, it opened up many new avenues. So just to show you a little bit of the history, these are just screen captures that I took of some of the players that are available today. Second Life was the most well-known. There was something else called Active Worlds. And let me ask the group, and maybe you could type in the chat if you're um, at a distance. Have any of you heard of the Harvard application of virtual reality? It was called River City. Has anyone heard of River City? Okay, no. Okay, and you might not hear, but some of you are coming in from the nursing program. Um, and, and actually, we have a lot of healthcare applications starting in virtual reality. It was created by Harvard to teach history. It went back to the 1800s to some place in Massachusetts where they used to have mills. And so the Active Worlds was a type of virtual reality that Harvard chose. Um, it's a little less expensive than Second Life. And what happened, though, as Second Life opened up its source code, other vendors came on the market. And the one to the right that's called Kitely is actually run by a little group out of Israel. And they run the servers, and they've made it very cost effective. So I'm using that with students of mine who are actually developing virtual islands. Um, and I do have some people developing healthcare applications. What I will say, though, is that if you are moving out of the Second Life area itself, and Second Life is expensive. To own an island will cost you $200 a month, and there's a $1,000 setup fee. So by moving into these new areas, other groups have started. And this just happens to be pictures of a user's group. And they recently ran a conference. So there are a lot of groups of support groups coming on. But if you look at the people in the group, they're quite international. And from my perspective, they're quite young. I wish I were as young as they were. Um, it's something being embraced by the younger generation who's much more comfortable with computers and probably played games like World of Warcraft. What is happening is as we've moved into these other environments, this particular website called Hypergrid Business has been keeping a lot of information available. And if anyone is interested in this PowerPoint later, I'll be glad to send it out because there are a lot of links in it. But for people who want to start developing their own environments, and there are a number of medical and nursing care programs starting into this environment, um, you could learn more from what they're doing. Um, what I wanted to say, too, is they have now launched a number of virtual conferences. This one actually is an old slide. Last year, they had one in September. Um, we had one this past November, and Empire State College, representing SUNY, went to that conference. So I'll show you some pictures from that. So the field is progressing rapidly, but I want to show you something of how I got into this environment. And originally, my interest came in the late 1990s when I was looking at my son-in-law, who could spend his whole life in virtual games. And he was an intelligent man, and I said, why is he so motivated to go into these games? And I would run around to schools, and I was a STEM teacher, okay? So I would look to see how are K-12 schools teaching people to use science. And I found that very often the methods were not really engaging kids who would then go home and spend hours on computer games. 
What you got? And so I was trying to find ways to motivate that generation. And I got into virtual development at the end of the 1990s, but there wasn't yet a way that you could move into it easily. So I couldn't get back in until the 2007s when it became available to me through Second Life at Empire State College. So um, I'm sorry, I'm getting a little feedback, I think, from the room itself. Is, and can the rest of you, am I clear enough for everybody? Okay, can you hear me? Okay. Um, all right, I just didn't want you to be hearing background noise, sorry. Uh, what I eventually did at about 2009, I started my own island. I got a little funding to create a virtual island, and I called it Serve which stood for the STEM Exploratory Real Virtual Environment. And we do have some nursing people here. And for the rest of you, STEM has become a term of art for science, technology, engineering, and math. So my goal was to create learning experiences in a virtual environment that could bring people in, initially kids in, to learn about STEM fields in a way that might be more engaging to them. So with that in mind, I did what I call stepping outside of my own box. Now, I teach online. I had 100% online classes where students were learning to be science teachers. Every other week, we would meet in the virtual space. And we would sit and pretty much like you're doing now, it was a lecture. It was kind of one way. So I started to look at things I could do that were different. And I had my students develop poster sessions. And I think, I don't know if I have a picture. I think I have a few pictures of them in here. But this was, I set up a room, put the posters around the room, and then the students all came together one night and presented to each other. And I presented this at other SUNY conferences. I videotaped it if you're interested. Um, but I moved into finding ways to get students involved. And I hope you can see this. It's a little bit fuzzy, but here are a number of my students. You'll see their avatars, and you'll see their names above their names. And what happened was students stood in front of their posters, just as if it were a conference, and then other students and faculty came and visited. And it was very interesting. I actually then had them vote on the different presentations. and. Um, got some very interesting results. It was very much as though they were really in the uh, actual environment. I moved a little further into this and created what I call pods. They were just little rooms, and I made them look somewhat like a science lab. Um, that's my attempt at making you know, kind of lab benches. And the students actually developed lessons that involved science, because we were teaching science, and they presented their lessons within these rooms. Now, the idea was that we would eventually bring K-12 schools into this environment, and I never did get quite that far. But my students got together, and this was another application where my students met with me, and they presented, they, they took the mic for whatever, I think we had 15 minutes, I taped them, and they presented to others in their class. And Second Life has a visual component, but it also has a text chat. It has an audio. Much of what we're doing now in a webinar, you can do in Second Life. Eileen? Yeah. Please enter your meeting ID followed by a pound or hash sign. mic is muted. OK, somebody's mic isn't muted. Yeah, and this is, I believe it's Becky. OK, let's see if. If you've joined us. Yeah. It, you actually, uh, you can mute everybody's mic. If you yeah, I know I can. If um, you can participants, you can mute people's mics. Okay, under participants. Let me see if I can pull that up high enough. Okay. And if, if someone doesn't have a red slash through their mic, you can go ahead and do that. Except okay. For mine or um, or Michelle's. Just keep ours out open. All oh, right. Oh, I see. Yeah, because okay. I made you a host. Yeah, and you know, I seem to have lost the the way to mute my own mic. I can't seem to find that on my desktop. 
Although I think we lost that background noise. Yeah, I think we're okay right now. Okay, <laughs> that's always funny. And I will tell you, this happens in virtual reality too. You get the dogs barking, babies crying, everything. And then people get annoyed at the person who forgot to mute their mic. <laughs> So my students were presenting, and I'm sure this was about two years back, we had mics going off in the background. But as you can see, adults stand around. Now, I also ran a pilot with K-12 kids, and this was interesting. If you, I just have a few background shots left. They were much more creative about how they dressed. They designed their own things. They didn't stay in one place. And I don't know if you can see towards the middle, um, there's a person that's very tall. These students were meeting from all across the Northeast, which is something to keep in mind. They are not in a geographic space. She happens to be a 10-year-old who was the shortest person in the group. She insisted on making her avatar very tall. And there's a whole research area that abounds around how people present themselves in virtual spaces. So these are spaces that are rife for all sorts of research. But um, that was very interesting. I did find that when you work with students, you've got to be stricter about some things. You don't have to teach them how to use the environment, but you have to teach them how to stop using it. So uh, depending on your audience, you'll have different constraints. Now, this was my toughest audience. I even tried to bring in faculty members. And for a year, we, a group of us intrepid virtual faculty uh, took, took turns inviting faculty into all sorts of meetings. And so we did have a meeting. We spent a year. We started with things like treasure hunts. Um, we did anything to engage faculty. And we did get some involved. But still, for a lot of faculty, it was a bit too heavy a lift. Um, and I will have to admit that even some of our instructional designers are worried. So you still mostly get the faculty who see the value for it. But this is shifting. Um, now, what I'm very excited about, I'm finally getting a sabbatical in this um, and that's why I'm glad to see nursing people here. Um, my goal is to create a simulation to teach healthcare in middle school. It's been something I've been working on for years. I'm actually working with some people from Africa. Now, the issue in Africa is they don't have technology. They don't have internet on a very large basis. So we're working in some ways that they can input data with mobile. Um, I happen to have some medical people who will be working with me. So this is my hope. It will, I'll be starting my sabbatical in a few weeks. And so I'm trying to use this as a virtual hub to bring together a number of STEM applications. So that's where I'm intending to go. But um, I think I'll pause now and ask for questions before I go too much more into what I've been doing. But, um, and maybe Andrew, I, I am going to try to bring up my um, chat on the side, but does, would anybody like me to talk a little bit more about some of my past work? Any questions? Okay, well, it looks, I'll, like we're, it looks like we're all set here for questions. Okay, I'll keep on going in the um, lecture mode. Oh, were the meetings, in, yes, they are synchronous, Cheryl, which is why they become much more like a real environment, because you actually meet together. Um, now, I have to work around the fact that I'm an online teacher. So what that sometimes means is I run two sessions, and sometimes I um, tape the session. You can use, um, I'm recently using Screencast-O-Matic. There are all sorts of ways that you can tape a virtual session. It's not quite as turnkey as something like Zoom or a webinar, but it's not too difficult. So if somebody has to meet, miss a session, um, yeah, you could, you could get people, yes, you could always bring people in through simpler ways. A webinar is easier, but you don't create community. And what I, I have to do is I have a variety of methods. I do use webinars too. But a webinar tends to be kind of one person oriented. What I can do in a virtual space is have a, create, a shared experience. As you can see back where, let me see if I can bring this in, um, where my students were doing the posters. Uh, 
I required the assignment, so you know they had to do it. But I didn't have to be there to host everything. They were able to walk around and talk to each other. And what I often do is I launch a lecture and maybe have some slides, and then I break them into groups. And I tell them to go to other parts of the island and have a breakout discussion. It's what I find in those meetings, that's where community develops. Otherwise, you tend to have the hierarchical, I'm the instructor, you're doing what I tell you. But I teach adults, and it's very, they're, they're very knowledgeable in, in and of themselves. And I found over about four years of doing it this way, I generally give them a topic. They find their own breakout sessions. And you can do this in a webinar, too. You can break them into different rooms. But there is something sub substantively, substantively different about their seeing and embodiment. Um, and there is research on it. I'm not a psychologist. I can tell you from experience, my students do a lot of bonding. Um, somebody is actually analyzing my class now. She couldn't quite figure out how it happened. So she's doing a practicum where she's studying my interactions. And she has been finding that it's those little threads of a discussion board here, a shared assignment there, and a virtual meeting that bring them together as community. So um, you can do this in a simpler way, but you won't get the community building. And that's a big part of what I try to do. Um, let me go over here. The Mallet program that I'm in now is about using emerging technologies. So I love it because it allows me to actually delve into this. Um, and I bring my students in, and they're now creating their own islands, which gave me another perspective. I'm a science person being put into a creative, amazing virtual environment. I now have students coming in who are creating things that are way outside what I would have done, and that's what's very exciting. Um, one of my students, and so I'm going to show you some of their work, and this was before, this was in Second Life. And the problem with Second Life is expensive. I could only give them a tiny little space. And so this artistic person got all sorts of interactive devices. She purchased them. You can purchase these things from vendors. They're not that expensive. And she created this kind of environment, and we, we, had, some, we had some wonderful parties at her place. You can also have a party in Second Life. You can't really do that. Uh, as a matter of fact, this was where we had the party. One of my students does dorm management at SUNY Albany. And I don't know, do any of you know what the SUNY Albany dorms look like? Anyone want to put in the chat, have you ever been there? They have four towers. Yeah. And, and, and some low rises. Yeah. And nobody's confessing to knowing those. You can't miss the towers. Yeah. Well, we had a party. Um, part of what the dorm management about is about has how do you break up parties so unfortunately I don't have this we had a hysterical party and I tried to put it up on YouTube but because we had background music that actually came from a, a free YouTube site but they, they wouldn't post our party so uh, if you're interested I have it on a private server but we simulated a party there and these are some of the things you can't do in a webinar well I guess you could but nobody would come we had music we had dancing um, it was really a good collaboration experience you wouldn't do that all the time but that would be useful so this was somebody who simulated the dorm environment and um, he put towers up and he just purchased those and repurposed them this other student brought us in. He wanted us, well, here's actually a good segue into why you might use these spaces. Um, this student wanted us to have some fun and learn how to get around. You know, kids get around easily. Adults, we need to be dragged in. So he dragged us in, put us on a trampoline, and we had a, a great time. He created these futuristic looking things. Um, but I had another student from SUNY Cobleskill, and he was teaching Ag, ag studies, and he brought us into a more classic classroom. So these were all Second Life applications. And what's opened up recently, though, have been this move to open source, which now says instead of $200 a month, for $15 a month, you can create something. So now my students are renting and creating their own islands, and that opened up a whole new world. Now, Andrew, how much more time do I have? Um, I want to show some of these, but 
and want to stick within your time limit. Okay, 10 minutes. Okay, if the group um, doesn't mind, I'll just show some more pictures. But um, if you want me to stop, I will stop. But what I think was the most exciting for me as somebody who tries to encourage people to develop islands was we got the lemons of Second Life was just too expensive. Consequently, my students only had a little incy space in which they could develop. We started to move out into open source. And what I saw, and I won't read all of this to you, but now that the students could design an entire space, they were able to go much further with their ideas. And as a student, my students were adults. They ran in age from 30 to 60. So a lot of them already had ideas. One guy did video production for a hospital. Uh, another woman teaches English as a second language. They were able to start bringing these things into their own environment. So I'll be pretty much closing maybe with some of the things they did. We met virtually every other week. So they were synchronous meetings, and I always have a backup if an adult can't make it, but they always came. Um, and even Andrew came to some of these meetings. Um, and I invited other classes, and they came too. They really enjoy meeting. Um, and one of the students was kind enough. She got very excited about the fact that there was a conference coming. She had really done nothing in virtual reality, but she found out that she could get us a booth at the conference. She set up a whole booth. She made us go to the virtual conference. She met with people from all around the world. And um, UC California has done a lot of work in virtual reality. And I was proud to say that SUNY was there as well. We weren't as far along as they were, but Terry brought us into this environment. Um, just another bit, we kept on meeting. Um, we also, I also went to my student spaces. So here you see me visiting some students. On the left was somebody who was setting up this futuristic biology environment for middle school. So she was creating a fun looking space and she looks, she's eventually gonna make herself look like a rabbit, um, but she looks like kind of a strange creature right now. The other person here on the right was doing um, tech setups. He was teaching high school. He was showing them how to set up a technical, um, a theater environment. So we had a variety of different people coming along. Um, other students, we went around and visit each, visited each other's work. You know, in a class, you can maybe have the students share a paper. This way, we were able to share the environment. And so you'll see a group of my students this past semester, and this is where some of where Andrew came along, actually visiting each other's locations. Um, so that was just to illustrate um, some of the aspects of community building. Um, I had an artist in the class. She did amazing work, and I'll show you a few more pictures. Um, I would just go to her space because it was so beautiful. She took a lot of the pre-made islands, and today you can start from pre-made things and modify them. And so she really went to do some very fantastic things. Let me see if I have some more pictures of her. Um, for example, she had a simulation with this coffee cup in the back. She was showing people how they would create a studio if they were showing an art show. So she had a lot of futuristic sculptures. Um, she had environments that would be important if you were teaching art. Um, but we had lots of other people. Um, here's Al. Al takes video for a hospital. He does a lot of hospital productions. So video is, is his thing. But he wanted to have his own video business. So he was setting up an island with a combination of things he bought, things he created, and things that were available for free to teach people how to do video. So he will continue on with teaching people how to do video. And he even found a little church. If you're going to be a video, videographer, you can do a lot of weddings. So he was teaching all sorts of things that would be important to his teachers. Um, this is a little drab. This is a science person like myself. He was developing hospital training. Um, he's at a hospital in New York that was running out of facilities for training. So he's looking at having virtual training to be a webinar, but more. So for some of you asking about webinars, um, he's actually bringing an entire SUNY hospital over to evaluate this environment. Um, Here's another, well, this was interesting. 
Uh, this is showing how one of my younger students, my youngest student, who is a digital native, he's in, in his 20s, he really took to this environment. He did some tutorials where he trained other members of the class. So I just took a few screen captures from the training that he was doing um, because I was fascinated by, he did this in um, Screencast-O-Matic. I could see how he was actually working through the process. So there's a lot of ways with technology today we can be looking at people's learning. Um, this student had a graphic arts background, so she was able to repurpose things and make them very attractive. Uh, but her whole idea was she was creating environment for people coming in from other countries. She works with them to teach them. And she wanted a comfortable place where they could feel at home and they could come to on their own. So you'll see she was creating a relaxing environment. And she also has a studio where you can come and learn new things. Um, here's my theater guy again. He was creating theater sets. And over in the bottom right, he was creating simulations of some of the tools you would use in the theater set. A few more before we stop. Um, I think I showed you Terry. She's the one who brought us to the virtual conference. And you can see State University of New York. She got us some exposure there. Uh, here's another one of the biology lady. Um, she's creating tutorials that will play along the side. And over in the bottom right, she's trying to create something that will look like an organelle. Now, she, like I, is a STEM person trying to move into art. So we're trying to get some more partnerships going. Um, she and I could be helped a little by some artists helping us. Um, oh, and back to one of my artists, Doris. Um, I showed you her work before. She brought us to a party. I don't know if you can see the upper, upper left. We had fireworks at the party. We had dancing. Um, she had made a snowman. There was a bug in the way she made the snowman. And every time we used it, it grew bigger and bigger. And so it was a rather exciting day. It was, it was just a lot of fun. Things came that we hadn't expected. Um, but just to finish, you don't have to use environments that you create. I found just a couple of pictures to show you. Um, for ELA people, there are beautiful haunting environments created for writers. For those of you, and I'm back to Second Life, where they have a lot of existing virtual spaces. Some of the newer places are getting them. Second Life had a whole thing on Russia. And I was uh, presenting to a group in Russia virtually, and they were very interested. Uh, lots of um, beautiful islands that you can visit just to create community. Uh, there was also this book island where you could come and participate in readings. So it's not just the one-on-one -on -one teacher control. Uh, you can, depending on how you want to set up community, send people around. There were ancient locations that was run through this museum island. I have sent my students on field trips so that they can just get to know each other and see other islands. And it depends on where you send them. Um, one of my students was an engineer. He found these interactive machines, and he loved them. So I just took this from his presentation. Um, he went around. Steampunk is something that's kind of big in virtual spaces where you can look at old machines. So he went around looking at the mechanization that was around at the end of the 1800s. So just to wrap it up, there are lots of ways that you can bring people to new experiences or you can create your own in the classroom. Um, and what I'd like to just recommend is that anything is possible, which is part of what makes this challenging. It's not limited. It's open to your imagination. You can create environments. You can use environments. You can be part of it. You can send your students there individually. It all depends on what your goals are. But I do invite you to step outside the box and you can do anything you can do in a webinar in this environment, but you can do more. And it's the more that I think makes it worth the extra time and, and, and environment. But um, I would ask any of you who are interested, there's my email address at Empire State College. It's just our name. Um, and you can put an apostrophe in or leave it out. And sometimes the apostrophes are very annoying, but um, I'll get the email either way. But I'll turn it back to you, Andrew, and I apologize for it being so one-sided. I hope next time to bring you in. Uh, absolutely. 
Um, I'm just going to bring up my camera here. Um, and I'm going to stop sharing. Yeah, do you want to exit full screen? Yeah. yeah. So you should be able to see me now, right? Yes, I can see you. And I can turn off my mic so you don't get feedback. So, um, you know, Eileen is really helpful. I, I met um, Eileen this past fall, like I was talking about. I'm just going to put the camera down for a bit. And she's really an ambassador of innovation. When I um, first started speaking with her in that SUNY meeting, um, I was a little bit intimidated myself when I saw virtual learning, like how could I build something? I mean, I played video games before, but how could I offer something and actually make something within a virtual learning environment? And um, Eileen was very, very helpful the first time we met. She invited me to a space in Kitely, which is um, a less expensive, more accessible version of Second Life, but really has a lot of the same elements. And before I knew it, I was building projection platforms where I could take um, a poplet presentation or um, an internet uh, or a website and project it on a platform that I built within a virtual world with the avatar that I had. Um, so it, it really was empowering to go from seeing a presentation to now I'm actually building in this virtual world. And um, what, I think one of the things that I really caught on with, with what Eileen said was, if an area or an organization is running out of spaces for training, now you could create this virtual learning environment to create that space so people can meet and interact. It's also a great way for, uh, great, great opportunity for networking. I met um, a person from Washington, D.C. in New York City in about 30 seconds, right when I entered Eileen's uh, class and we had a nice little discussion, shared our background a little bit and our, uh, our interest in um, uh, virtual world. So um, just want to open it up to more questions, if we have any questions from our folks that are attending remotely or uh, anybody that's uh, in, in person right now. This is my, my first exposure to this period. So is it still life? Is it, is it turn into action? Is it, is it animated? Or I mean, I'm still kind of stumped on virtual reality. And I mean, how do you create a meeting space for people to meet? I mean, you're just looking at a picture with people's avatars or I mean, how does this all? Is it that? That's a good question. And, you know, it's one of those things that I look and say, I'm kind of overlooking the obvious. Um, you actually move into the environment and you can create the environment to look like anything you want. You know, it's 3D building. Or you could go to an island that exists. But you actually have an avatar. When you're sitting at your computer, your avatar is what is moving. And I do have some tapes um, that I could bring up through YouTube. I'm not sure if they'll work too well. Um, maybe I could send them to you where I actually taped my students in this space. And you could see them talking. You can send the link in the chat box if you want. OK, let me find one. Um, let me see. Theater set. Well, I, I think I'll send this conference tab. Uh, you can see Terry is actually in the space. Okay, I'm going to put this into the chat box and send that over. Terry was presenting, and I don't know if you want to run that. Can you run that? And I could talk, but you'll you'll get a sense of me interviewing her. And so I think you can see her in the background. I'll turn my mic off if it's something you could show, but that's a good question. No, you actually appear to walk around, even though you're sitting at your computer. Terry Warman explains how she created an Empire State College booth at the Open Simulator Community Conference. So welcome, everyone. My name is Terry Warman, and I'm a first-year student in the Mallet of Arts um, in Learning and Emerging Technologies here at Empire State College. And I'm standing in front of our exhibit area at the Open Simulator Community Conference 2014 which is happening uh, this weekend, November 8th and 9th. So the idea is we got this exhibit space and it allowed us to create a space 
that hopefully people who come by can actually learn more about Empire State College, about our program, the degree program, and also to be able to send some examples of students' work that they're doing right now, especially in our uh, practicum in virtual worlds. Uh, this build was actually part of my practicum um, in trying to learn not only more about how do you create a conference in virtual world, but also just to, this is actually my first attempt at doing a build in open simulation. This is our Empire State College Mallet Exhibit Area. We, we saw the video, it was a great uh, example of how you could uh, inquire about the virtual uh, world environment for some, for some of your students. Oh, good. Yeah, so wonderful. does that at least give you better visual sense of what yeah, it is? Yeah, that was great. And everybody got to see it in the room. And, and people that are um, um, joining remotely, they can just click on the link and play it. So that was a great opportunity. I, I did send a few more links. And there's a little prompt that tells you what it is. If anyone wants to maybe copy paste those out, if they even look at them later. Um, just some more examples. My students all did something from four to seven minute um, overviews of what they were creating. So that's what those links mostly are. Um, that, that's my students' work. And you can see they have a, a real range of applications. It's just them talking, though. It's not really an interactive session. Wonderful. Well, Eileen, thank you so much uh, for your presentation today. Like I said, you are you know, an ambassador of innovation and really uh, getting the message out there about uh, you know, virtual worlds and how we can learn in those environments. And you know, I, I just gave a presentation about screencasting and it's about looking beyond just the uh, surface of the technology, but optimizing the technology and maximizing its potential. And you certainly demonstrated that today. And just wanna thank you for presenting today. And um, I just want, it doesn't seem like anybody else has any more questions, but feel free to email Eileen. She's very, very supportive if you want to learn more about uh, virtual worlds. Yes, and thank you. And thank you for having me and setting up the conference. I know it's a lot of work. Um, please thank Michelle, yourself, and everybody else. Yeah, absolutely, Eileen. Okay. Have a great day, and uh, I'll be in touch, Eileen. Uh, okay. All right, thank you for coming, everybody. I appreciate your time. Bye. Bye.